words and we'll start off. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you all, our distinguished guests from abroad, um, our colleagues from Israel, uh, faculty and students. We are honored to host this uh, year's annual meeting of the uh, International Forum on Online Dispute Resolution here in Israel at the University of Haifa, Faculty of Law, and in our uh, Haifa Center for Law and Technology. Israel is definitely a good place to host this conference on online dispute resolution. Not because of the obvious reasons that we have many conflicts and disputes to resolve, but actually because of the role of information technology and technological innovation and, and the way in which they play in the Israeli economy and Israeli society. On a more personal note, this conference for me is a closing of a circle. I was first introduced to online dispute resolution back in the 90s. Um, at least I thought I was introduced to that. It's a totally different thing today. Uh, back in 1991, uh, as a young LLM student at Harvard Law School, I took a seminar on artificial intelligence uh, and legal reasoning by Professor Edwina Riesland, colleague of uh, Ethan Katch, um, exploring the limits of um, artificial intelligence and legal reasoning. She talked a language that no one spoke at Harvard Law School or at any other law school, uh, these days, uh, those days, uh, a language which combined computer science, legal theory, uh, and some uh, practical insights. This language has now become prevalent. It is now a language that is being spoken in many law schools, and it is definitely the language that this conference speaks. While working with Ethan and Orna uh, on putting together this conference, I discovered the wealth of scholarly research, technology advancement, and the practical experience which were accumulated in this field over the years. I realized that it's about time to go back to that seminar paper which I wrote 20 years ago on legal reasoning and um, rewrite it. The International Forum on Online Dispute Resolution was visionary in identifying the keys for the current transformation of legal institutions. The changing nature of technology and the changing nature of legal institutions. Information technology is transforming not only the way we do business and connect to friends, uh, it also creates new types of conflicts, new ways for doing business, bring about massive volume of international transactions among anonymous buyers and sellers around the world. New modes of collaborative production introduce new disputes among users and the thousands of co-authors of the collaborative creation. New ways of engaging in politics, facilitating campaigns via Facebook, but also surveillance of individuals in invasive methods of governance. Information technology also offer uh, innovative mechanisms for resolving some of these disputes. Communication facilities, coordinating tools, online mediation, automatic filing, and dispute management are changing the way we collaborate with an one another, but also the way in which we organize and um, collectively act together. These tools, which often regulate our behavior, uh, reflect a particular value system uh, and design our social institutions in new and innovative ways. While talking to some of the people um, uh, during the, the coffee break we, we just had, I thought that uh, it's actually transforming also our law school to move from the traditional law schools into a more, to schools that are more integrated into uh, information technology and computer science departments. We are far from uh, fully comprehending the implications of these mechanisms for a notion of law and our understanding of traditional legal institutions which apply within national borders. 
This inquiry is a key for our understanding of the information economy and the information society in which we reside. The focus on the interconnection between legal institution and technology also lies at the heart of our own research and teaching at the Center for Law and Technology here at the University of Haifa. It is therefore a great pleasure uh, to welcome you here. I'm grateful to Ethan and to Orna for putting together this terrific program and I'm very much looking forward to the next two stimulating and fun days. Thank you. I'm Ethan Katch. I'm the uh, director of the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to have, a, have had a hand in, in actually all of the, uh, the nine o international ODR forums that have taken place since 2001. Uh, the first two were, were held in Geneva under the auspices of the UN Economic Commission for Europe, and uh, the guiding figure uh, at that time, De Wan Choi, uh, at some point was transferred to Thailand and uh, to the Asian Economic, the Economic and UNESCAP, whatever uh, that acronym uh, stands for. And uh, at some point, during fourth or fifth or sixth forum, uh, we became, is this not on? In any event, we have had nine of these, and we've had them uh, actually, I think, on every continent. Uh, and Orna volunteered, uh, and uh, actually all of our hosts uh, have volunteered to sponsor these meetings. And uh, they give me credit for this, but basically I've been on the receiving end of a variety of emails every so often, and I've left all the responsibility I, I think all the credit should go to Orna Neva Maital, who is outside, uh, and the University of Haifa. It really is a, a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, the connection between technology and, and dispute resolution. Uh, for me, it was an obvious uh, kind of connection. When the web was getting started, it, it seemed to me at least obvious that uh, the web would not be a conflict-free environment. Quite the contrary. There was too much activity online. Uh, people were, were, were creating things of, of value. Uh, there were too many transactions online. Uh, there were huge numbers of relationships formed online. All of these things contribute to, to conflicts of certain kind. And uh, dispute resolution it also seemed to me, was a, uh, a process based on the communication and use of information. So it seemed to me that there was a close fit between both the creation of conflict and the resolution of conflict. Uh, the unfortunate part of this is that it's much easier to create conflicts and generate conflicts than it is to resolve conflicts. Uh, generating conflicts really doesn't take much planning. Uh, Resolving conflicts requires a lot of planning. So uh, there's a much larger challenge for those of us who want to uh, figure out how to respond to conflict than for those who, for some reason, have an interest in, in generating conflict. And of course, most conflicts are generated by people who, who don't want to generate conflict at all. In any event, uh, it's wonderful to see so many people here. It's wonderful to see uh, people from from so far away uh, and it's uh, wonderful that this meeting actually has evolved in an almost uh, conflict free process at least from my from my end <laughs> and I don't want to think of what the, all the conflicts at this end but uh, Orna Neva and, and the others from the university really were most grateful to you
to adjust. Just a few more words uh, before we get um, started. Um, I'm going to leave most of the thank yous for the end, but I really um, also cannot start without, uh, first of all, thanking Meital and Lily, who have worked days and nights, literally, uh, to put this all together. So. There were others helping them, but um, I'll leave that for later. And I also must mention our sponsors, um, without whom we really um, certainly wouldn't have food. <laughs> but uh, it would be very difficult to put this uh, together. And uh, aside from uh, the Haifa Center of Law and Technology, the Faculty of Law, and the University of Haifa, we've had external sponsors. I can. I want to thank Frank Valley, the Ombudsman for ICANN, uh, the Public Affairs Section of the uh, American Embassy, Cyber Settle, both the American, uh, where do we have here? Oh, yeah. Uh, both the American side and uh, the Israeli rep, and uh, uh, Shlomo Cohen law firm, uh, Haifa-based law firm that does ADR. All of these have generously contributed and have enabled us to put this together. I want to say um, just a couple of words about ODR in Israel, sort of continuing um, Ethan's uh, thread, and then that would segue us right into uh, our next sec section. So. Um, Surprisingly or not surprisingly, we do have, uh, uh, certainly not surprising for me, we do have a few, uh, several ODR schemes in place in Israel that are uh, very innovative, very successful, and uh, in fact are quite diverse. And just to mention the few I am familiar with, and we will uh, be able to uh, get a first-hand impression of them throughout these two days, we have the NOM online arbitration system, which has really evolved into something much broader, as we will hear in just a few minutes. Uh, Benoam uh, started out, at least, as an online arbitration system between uh, insurance companies, repeat players, similar scale, handling one type of dispute, bumper-to-bumper uh, -bumper disputes, uh, but has since grown. Emuna Tzibu, consumer organization, uh, the leading uh, consumer organization in Israel, um, basically has had an ODR uh, process in place for a while, an online complaint handling system in which they serve as a facilitator and are thinking as well of expanding what they have uh, in place. CyberSettle, probably the uh, most successful venture, in on offers online bidding uh, negotiation services uh, both abroad and is being uh, introduced into the Israeli setting uh, by Roy Yishkol. Uh, we also have an Israeli affiliated of Smart Settle, a uh, negotiation support system that does something totally different. And I'm, I hope you will be in the audience and in any event we'll get a chance to get an impression of Smart Settle during uh, those, these two days. And we have a venture called AllRise.com, which has developed a virtual community court which targets uh, the international community. So we see we have a variety of processes that target different dispute types, um, different types of disputants. So although we would certainly like to see more of ODR, um, I think this gives us uh, much room for optimism and uh, for pride. So I'd like to start us off with um, ODR in action. Um, as Neva had said, this is uh, uh, a field that brings together the academia and practice, the, the world of practice. And therefore, we thought it would be appropriate to actually start with a taste of these systems in action. So we are bringing together two um, different systems. One is the one of the pioneers in online dispute resolution, eBay, uh, presented uh, by Colin and Chitu. And um, eBay obviously uh, functions on the uh, global e-commerce um, setting and will also have an introduction of the Benam system and what they have evolved into, which at least initially started out as a local project where disputants were actually not distant at all, could meet and convene in one room and still preferred not to do so and found many advantages, uh, perhaps more than meet the eye uh, for the ODR scheme. So without further ado, um, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Colin and Cheeto from eBay, and we will later uh, introduce uh, uh, Yuda Tunic, advocate Yuda Tunic. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Sorry for the delay. Of course, uh, part of the Any Technology Conference. Any Technology Conference involves many, many laptops being switched and projectors being switched. So hopefully, we'll get your tolerance for all of that. Um, uh, Chitu and I are honored to be uh, one of the first speakers helping to set the frame for the conversation today. Um, and but it's only 15 minutes, and Warner made very clear we're just giving a taste just to sort of scope out some of the potential uh, range of our discussions today. eBay obviously has been doing online dispute resolution for a very long time. Ethan, who you've already heard from, here I'll step back. Here I can do it. All right, let's see. Fingers crossed. Let me try it one more time. Okay, there we go. Yes. There we go. Excellent. Uh, no, I don't need it. We can advance it here. That's a very good sign. If the first laptop actually connects with the projector, that means you're going to have a wonderful conference. So it's much like a fortune cookie. So we've opened it up, and we've gotten a good fortune. So, um, so I'm going to begin very briefly, and then I'm going to hand it over to Chitu. Um, so eBay does, we do more than 40 million disputes a year around the world. Uh, I've been working at eBay for about five and a half years. I am honored to take on the online dispute resolution work that was begun by Ethan um, in conjunction with eBay back in when? 1999, Ethan? Yeah, and it's grown into a, a huge, huge institution of online dispute resolution. And we've learned a lot, um, but we're not going to be focusing on those 40 million disputes. We're going to be focusing on a very new application that I think has grown out of eBay's body of practice that I think is extremely exciting. And I, I will give, first of all, I will give Chitu all the credit for building the system. Chitu, the founder, many of you know her, the founder of ODR World, ODR India, an online dispute resolution pioneer. We were lucky enough to get her to help us out. She's based in Chennai, which is a big development center for eBay and PayPal. And she's going to walk you through what we put together, the community court. I also want to give a shout out for my street lingo here in the United States to Dan Ryman in the audience. Dan, are you here? No. Dan will be here th later, I think. And he is the creator of AllRise.com, which is an Israeli community court, not focused on eBay volume, but it's roughly touching on the same area of innovation within ODR. So what, just what I want to name briefly before framing uh, Chitu's comments, uh, you know, online dispute resolution is in the process of reinventing itself. You know, we're a young field, but there's a lot of innovation that's occurring. And I think one of the things that's happening at eBay is we are realizing with our, with the, our relentless customer focus that customers want versions of online dispute resolution that are, that are different than some of the models that have dominated our field to this point. We see a lot more increasing automation. As volume grows to, the, to 10, 20, 30 million cases, the ability to pay for humans to manage each one, one of these cases drops. And that's the, the importance of software and smart coding um, it rises uh, with, with that increase in volume. Crowdsourcing is a very hot buzzword in Silicon Valley right now. And that's really what the community court is, is it is a crowdsourced ODR solution. I think we're going to be talking about that a lot. And the other thing, I've said this at other ODR, you and ODR gatherings, I believe the number one determinant of success in online dispute resolution is enforceability. And that's one of the reasons why I think the community court has absolute enforceability. That's been part of its secret to success. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Chitu, and I'll maybe come back at the end. All right, one more slide. I'll do one more slide, and then I'll hand it to Chitu. So we recently won, Chitu and I put together this, uh, this uh, program for what we call PayPal Lab Rats, which is an internal incubator for ideas. It's like an, an innovation competition. And there's a lot of competition from around the world, hundreds of ideas from developers. And we were fortunate to win that competition in December. And that's given us a lot of momentum and a lot of resources coming out of PayPal to pursue this idea. But fundamentally, the community court is a court comprised solely of eBay community members who are then empowered by eBay to decide cases. So we do not have third-party professional mediators and arbitrators or customer service representatives deciding these cases. So Chitu, as the creator of this mechanism and the, the genius behind it, who's managed it since day one, is going to walk you through exactly how it works. But that's the basic idea. Thanks, Colin. Um, the com is this on? Yeah, you got to get really close to it. Hello. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so what the community code does is it's very simple and uh, we usually have about only four stages so we've restricted to four stages and we had the time frame issue as well uh, being in uh, you know e-commerce uh, area and where uh, you know people want instant remedy and instant solution um, we thought that we will have a 22 day um, frame we actually started off with 30 days and we had to reduce it the duration for uh, 22 days uh, the seller files a complaint and uh, it's usually we are using this for feedback disputes on eBay and uh, what happens is when uh, the seller uh, is not happy because now the policy is only the buyer can leave a feedback for seller on eBay so when the seller is not happy with the feedback he does uh, you know he, what he does is he goes and he appeals to the community court so he files a dispute on the community court and uh, the buyer is given uh, some time to respond to the dispute the buyer responds to the dispute on the community court and then the seller rebuts again he has a two day time frame to um, you know just respond to the buyer's response and after that the case is put to the jury voting stage what happens in the jury voting stage is the cases are assigned randomly to jurors so we have for jurors we have an eligibility criteria where um, the jurors are comprised only of eBay members and uh, you have a certain eligibility criteria this court is for India what we're doing is we just have 21 jurors because that's what uh, eBay India wanted because eBay India is a really uh, small platform so we wanted only 21 jurors and they vote and then once they reach a majority then the case is decided either in favor of the seller or the buyer eBay India wanted a simple majority so we uh, use that uh, this is how the platform works and it's live on uh, www.ebaycode.com this is how it looks and this is how you write an appeal there are only four stages so you write an appeal here then the buyer responds so you see the second stage out there so your statement and then of course it goes to the juror voting stage and then you have uh, the jurors voting on this with a simple majority um, of course we're going to do um, I think an elaborate session uh, later this evening uh, so probably you know if you want to learn more uh, we are coming up with different type of applications so you know we'll talk more at that time because now we're constrained for time um, so far the statistics have been that um, until last week uh, 1100 cases have been completed using this system uh, we expected only to receive about 50 cases a month we started only in December so for about uh, six months you know we expected to get only like uh, 50 cases a month but you know we've got but 1100 cases and um, we have about uh, 365 jurors and these jurors are eligible jurors you know whom we think are um, you know suitable to vote on these cases we also do a little bit of juror monitoring because you know you always uh, wonder whether they're going to uh, you know vote always in favor of the seller or always in favor of the buyer so out of that 15 jurors have been removed uh, because you know they've been biased or you know some uh, untoward activity has been noticed and uh, the research part of it, I think Colin will take through sure. to the research part of it. So again, because uh, we're very constrained for time, we're not going to go into much detail, but we've been doing a lot of research on this project. We're very eager to get feedback from our colleagues about your thoughts as we refine this idea. We've had interns from Harvard, from Creighton University, from Pepperdine University, from Haverford College who've worked with us to help refine this. Uh, we've done surveys, not only of all the buyers and sellers and jurors who participated in India, but as we've looked into expanding it around the world, we've surveyed other eBay users to get their sense, and we just uh, recently completed a research project with Harvard it was a, a, a semester-long project. We did a lot of research to determine the effectiveness of the court. Um, and the feedback has been fantastic. It's been very supportive from the, the eBay India Trust and Safety team, but also, more importantly, from all of the users that, that have gone through, have been extraordinary compl extraordinarily complimentary about the idea. So again, it's not just about this one application. We're, starting to we're trying to just put an idea out there that can help uh, be a, a, maybe a straw man that we can beat around today uh, as we discuss how the ODR field is developing. But I I do think that there are a lot of aspects of the community court that represent the learnings of this field over the last 10 years, and they help to give us vectors that we can follow to, to increase the penetration and satisfaction of ODR in the, in the global uh, set of disputes that, that uh, we're most likely to target. So I think that's our 15 minutes, right, Orna? All right, so please, if you want to learn more, come to our session this afternoon and uh, from Chitu, and I thank you very much. We are very, very excited about participating in this over the next two days. Thank you very much. Thank you.
next uh, presenter of another ODR scheme in action is uh, our very own. Excuse, it doesn't work. Can you hear me now? Okay. Our next presenter of uh, an ODR in action scheme is our very own advocate Yuda Tunik, our very own, I mean, Israeli, of course, uh, who has been really uh, a pioneer in this area. As I said, uh, started out with Benom online arbitration system. This has evolved and developed much beyond the initial scope and I'm eager to hear, uh, we, he will give us some background on Benam and I'm eager to hear on where he is headed. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> One, two, okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants of the ODR conference. Firstly, I would like to thank Dr. Orna Aini, the chair of this enlightening conference, for inviting us to present before you the computerized systems that our company developed and operates, web-based, <coughs> for the management of arbitral and ADR proceedings, as well as the administrative aspects of the ADR Institute. It is practically a computerized courthouse in which claims, statements of defense, evidence, etc., and all relevant data are submitted through the designated systems. All parties are connecting to the system via <coughs> the web with no need to installations of hardware. Currently, the system handled only in Israel more than 55,000 arbitration cases in the last five years, something around 1,000 cases per month. Uh, since we are short of time, my introduction words will be short and I will directly present before you a brief description of our company, product and vision and afterwards a clip of the ADR system. So, so please. First one was okay. Okay, we are speaking about uh, web-based solutions from internal and outsourced work up to the, fuel, the full dispute of resolution system. Next. Uh, our vision is to provide systems to bridge practically the gap between modern way of business and traditional legal systems to resolve, promptly resolve disputes and manage claims. As you can see, the company portfolio of systems from internal management up to management of arbitral proceedings and administrative aspects of the arbitral institutes. Main users, insurance companies, banks, prosecution authorities, arbitral institutes, governmental authorities, etc. So. 
The systems were successfully developed thanks to the strong synergy between comprehensive legal knowledge and cutting-edge technology, as you'll see in a few minutes. As you can see, there are a little, a few forms that in a few minutes you'll see them working, uh, online working, uh, all kinds of actions to be performed through, through the system itself. And now we are going to the real thing. System. With a click, click of, of a button, button you, you can streamline, accelerate, accelerate and, and simplify given arbitrary proceedings, 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 along with their administration, monitoring, archiving, and data, data retrieval. By, By using, using the system, you optimize the cost-benefit ratio and generate invaluable knowledge. Introducing a central system in which the transfer of information, material, and communications between parties involves significantly less time-consuming and distance-dependent procedures. The system serves and benefits the arbitral institution, the arbitrators, the parties, and the legal counsel. Each user, or all simultaneously, regardless of location or time, may easily and immediately gain web access to the case in order to retrieve, upload, or share information and materials assigned to the case with other case parties. In order to institute a claim, a prospective claim merely clicks on the Submit Claim button. A, a, you, you have submitted, submitted the claim, screen, screen opens. opens. After, After filling, filling in particular particulars required by the rules of the art. Attention, Attention required by...
our system, everybody wins. The system enables streamlined processes, 24-7 user-friendly access and online monitoring, reduce arbitration cycle times, overcome geographical barriers, and result in better service and greater customer satisfaction. Reduce overhead and arbitration-related expenses, such as calls to arbitrators, international courier services, faxes, travel, and more. Gain updated financial control to allocate arbitrators' fees and track their position of advanced payments and guarantees. Monitor arbitrators' expenses, such as appointment of experts, traveling expenditures, etc. Increase the productivity of arbitrators' work by providing them with tools to facilitate their work administrative burdens, and streamline communications and exchange of information, regardless of geographical locations. Tap into invaluable resources, become information and statistics in power, and reduce archiving costs by using digital archiving. Safeguard content, retrieve files, and generate knowledge through advanced reports and inquiries. CIM is the founder and operator of computerized systems for management and discharge of claims. The company's management is comprised of a synergy between legal and technological expertise. Over the past few years, tens of thousands of arbitration cases have been successfully administered by CIM's system in various industries. that the, this new system has evolved into um, when I thought of juxtaposing these two uh, case studies for audio in action um, uh, I think really the, the roots of where CIM, CIM came from are so different from um, eBay and uh, all of these experiences comprise the ODR landscape so um, um, this really I think shed some light on the sources of the ODR field and uh, and teaches us something about where it is headed. Um, we do have a coffee break scheduled, but uh, our thought was, at least we don't feel tired yet, our thought was if, if our speakers uh, for the next panel are up to it, uh, we thought we would go ahead with the panel and then extend lunch, which is always a good idea. Um, so are the speakers uh, up for it? Um, yeah, okay, great. Then, um, as I am the chair, I will stay here.
Yeah, you don't need sound. Huh? I don't need sound. It's the only, um... You have said it? It's the only file that's not in the folder. I, um, I am delighted and honored to um, open uh, the first plenary session after our taste of ODR in action. Uh, we're starting some, some more of the talking part. And uh, uh, this session is entitled ODR and the Emerging Online Justice System, New Institutions, New Processes, and New Perspectives, sort of laying out the stage of what's out there and where we're headed, give us a taste of the next two days. And uh, we have an, a very impressive panel with us. Um, I would like to um, start off, uh, unless people have preferences, I thought of starting off with you, Colin, uh, then Salil, Guy, and end up with Ethan, add a few of my own comments, and then open it up for conversations and questions. And hopefully, we'll have enough time for discussion. So please jot ahead the questions while you're listening. Okay. Lorna, we've dynamically rearranged ourselves because uh, Salil's already set up here. So Perfect. So Salil yeah. starts. Okay, no problem. Great. And, um, uh, oh, I use this version of the show. How do you do a yeah. show on this one? I, I don't, um, I've not, I still have 2003. See, just click down here. Oh, like yeah. That link right yeah. there. There you go. <laughs> the new version's got me. Oh, okay. No, this should be good. Okay. All right, well, um, thanks uh, everyone here at Haifa for hosting this. Uh, I, I'm very um, honored to be part of this plenary um, session, and, um, and everyone has been very nice. Um, and also thanks to, to Neva, who gave me um, some really helpful comments on an earlier version. Um, and to the extent that any of you have seen an earlier version, um, this has changed a little bit. Um, but, but the ver uh, since since the fall, if you had actually read it then, w and it was available online, so there's been a shift in emphasis. So I should I should explain what what we're doing or what we've done here, which is that first of all, um, Wikipedia has an arbitration system. Um, some of you may have known that. If you didn't, that's the first thing to sort of gather is there's an arbitration system, right? Um, and this the we wanted to test a few. Themes together with my, I should mention, I have a co-author, my colleague David Hoffman, also at Temple. Um, one of them, the original simplest thing we wanted to test was the idea that, um, although theoretically Wikipedia is about creating an encyclopedia and, and capturing content, that the arbitration system was not about content. That actually turns out to be the easiest thing to show. Um, but the other things we wanted to think about was um, sort of the mechanism by which people. Um, work together on Wikipedia in, in, in terms of how this arbitration system deals with condu conduct and what it does um, to deal with that conduct, bad conduct, good conduct, um, what have you. And so, so the, you know, Wikipedia is, is of course, is, is this poster child for social production. I mean, most famously um, in Yohai Benkler's book. Um, but others have written about it too, and have really stressed how um, there's this incredible ability for people to um, participate, to realize their um, altruistic, non-monetary impulses. You know, the whole idea of the internet lowering the the barriers to doing that. That's not actually the, our focus, right? We 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 accept that that that's, that there is this this altruistic impulse, and it has become easier to realize. Our focus instead is more on why they can actually cooperate, right? Because these are people um, who do not actually fit sort of the, the Robert Ellison um, order without law paradigm. They don't live in a community um, that is organic, that they 
have to be sort of locked into, and more importantly, how do they actually cooperate? That's our, our biggest focus. Not only why do they cooperate, but how can they possibly do it, since they are going to have um, inherent disagreements. If you think, and, and by disagreements, what I mean is, if you think about the Wikipedia project, um, the idea of a, a level of conflict is, is really kind of built into the DNA of the site. If you think about what the wikis look like, and I, and unfortunately I don't have a, uh, a page up, but you think about any Wikipedia page, and you go, most of you have seen, all of you have probably seen the Wikipedia, most, almost all of you have probably looked at a discussion page, and if it's anything that's at all controversial, you'll see the back and forth between the editors. Actually, you'll see it even if it's something that's not particularly controversial, right? And so built into this idea is this kind of, uh, this, this built into the site is this kind of idea that truth is going to emerge from this kind of dialectical discussion, right? So the con conflict is built in. So the question is, how are these people able to cooperate? Um, you know, and, and the existing theories we found were not very specific on the mechanism, and that's not necessarily their fault. That wasn't their focus, right? Their focus was more like, this is amazing. These, these people aren't being paid, and they've generated, you know, they're capturing as much of their version of human knowledge as they can. But what, what could be doing this, right? Uh, people have pointed to norms, because Wikipedia is actually very good at promoting sort of PR about its own norms, particularly the idea of objective writing. Right, the idea that people are going to have a neutral point of view. Um, perhaps there's another norm out there that they promote a lot, that there's a, a kind of buy-in by the community into the project. Right? Um, could it be law? Um, there's not really legal cases in the sort of black letter sense. We think that there's something like law that's emerged, and there is some relationship between law and norms here, although I'm not sure we capture exactly what's happening. We are focusing more on this mechanism of what this system they've set up does. And so many of you may be familiar with um, the structure of Wikipedia, but the basic idea here is it's very large, right? I don't know in the, this slide if it's that readable, but um, so you've got you know, 13 million total um, registered uh, total pages, you've got 17 million users, most of them don't actually um, edit very, oh, okay. Most of them don't actually edit very actively. And so you've got, you, you, it boils down to, you know, 1,500 administrators. That's still a lot of people with the power to, to block people temporarily or do various things. To get 1,500 people on one page is not easy. Um, and then there's, there's smaller numbers of, of other people uh, culminating with the founder, Jimmy Wales, who still um, holds a certain kind of, um, uh, of individual power, right? And so that's the basic structure, and it is, is a nonprofit um, foundation that holds uh, the ownership of the site. Actually, should, I should say sites. We focus on English, um, but obviously there are, there are many other sites. So the, um, the basic sense is that what we want to point out is that arbitration exists at sort of the culmination of failures, right? If there's a dispute resolution system and you only get to the arbitration um, point if you failed it at various levels. So, right, as I mentioned, the wiki has this kind of conflict built in, right, the actual discussion page behind a, uh, a Wikipedia entry. Um, and so maybe people resolve their dispute at the page level, right? They get, figure a way to get along. Um, or um, they can, if they can't, they seek comment from other users and try to develop some sort of consensus based on that input. Further on, they can seek mediation, which is, is non-binding um, and is, is based on you know, traditional methods of mediation. And finally, they have set up an arbitration system. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is. So what they did is essentially they borrowed, and the paper goes into more detail, um, they borrowed from some elements in AAA, the American Arbitration Association set up, and then they changed them a lot, right? And so essentially they set up a committee of arbitrators um, who were elected on a kind of approval basis. You, you had people who had a certain amount of experience in the community got to vote to approve a slate, and then um, Wales, uh, the, the founder, would pick people from that slate to be part of the 12 arbitrators. This is actually in flux now, so they may change this system. But when they set up the arbitration system, there was actually, and we, we looked at the discussions among the people involved, because they're, they're again, they preserve these archives, there's actually um, quite a bit of, of sort of tension among them because 
they, not unlike I think a lot of groups on the internet, just kind of sus subscribe to this idea that they could self-govern without rules and law. Right? We've seen this sort of techno-libertarianism before. Additionally, beyond techno-libertarianism, they, they also had a kind of tension because they had a kind of techno-communitarianism going on. They thought that they, you know, that if they, if they could all get along and buy into a consensus, they wouldn't need this kind of law, right? And so there were concerns about, and they still use this term, wiki lawyering. People getting too technical in the dispute resolution system, acting like lawyers, that would be bad, right? Um, but they started to bargain in the shadow of law. When I say that, and the paper talks a little bit about this, they sometimes bargained in the shadow of, of what they m wrongly perceived the law to be. For example, they thought there, in their discussions that you could get sued for having inaccurate statements uh, about facts, right? You could get sued, but you probably aren't liable, right, in, in under American law, unless you, you really go wrongfully uh, off, the, off the charts. They also thought that somehow, if they had an arbitration system, that would create, you know, and then they got sued later, that would create some sort of uh, stronger position for them uh, before a, an actual, you know, publicly funded judge. It's not clear that's true either, but they, they bargain in the shadow of these, these perceptions. Um, there was some resistance, fears that it would be slow, that it would dominate the energy of the site, it, that it would get them bogged down into um, something like law, essentially, or what they perceived to be the failures of law. But they did it anyway, right? And so here's an example of an arbitration committee, a segment of an arbitration committee opinion. So basically what happens is when the arbitration committee um, gets a complaint, they create a, something that looks very much like a, uh, a kind of an internet version of a legal decision. First, there's a set of, uh, th first is the description of who complained, right? So it starts off not on like a civil complaint, and then it turns into something very criminal justice-like. So first there's whoever complained and what they complained about. Then they talk, then they have a statement of principles, right? Not statement of laws, but principles where they start to list the principles that they think are relevant to this decision, right? And then there, is, uh, there are findings of fact. And then finally, there are, there's a list of enforcement acts or what will be done to the violator or violators. Some of these cases have more than one violator who's dealt with. On each of the findings of facts and on the enforcement, the arbitrators vote. Now, so you actually get a record of, of who voted for what. Um, and so what we did here was we actually only looked at the things that they voted, uh, you know, did, it, did this point go ahead or not? You know, we didn't, we didn't say, okay, seven to one, or this, you know, this particular arbitrator looks this way, because there's only, you know, we, we really were fo focusing on the end result of punishment and the sort of, and what kind of conduct drew punishment. Um, so here's an example. Um, of someone who gets banned from Wikipedia for a year because they are not an objective, um, they are not an objective editor. In fact, they go beyond that. They actually seem like they're not valuing the site, right? They they view it as a soapbox to push a point of view, um, but as a as a kind of an advocate in a political way. And one we draw, we want, and this is the sort of thing we wanted to test is to what extent Wikipedia is looking for people who can discuss without becoming partisans, essentially. Um, a, another example is a more garden variety, sort of antisocial behavior example, personal attacks. Just making attacks on an individual, just saying you know, bad things about them. Some of them can be based on, um, you know, it could be based on gender or race or ethnic identity or what have you. Others could just be, you know, sort of stalking this person online. Everywhere they go, you know, you show up and you say nasty things about them, right? Um, you can get banned for that too. So uh, the other sort of simple idea is that they have to exclude some people. Some people are just really bad. So the question is, wh what do they really exclude for? Are they excluding for bad editing? Or are they excluding for bad conduct? Or are they doing other things with respect to content? These are the kinds of questions we wanted to look at. So what we did was we looked at, at starting at in um, a p uh, early 2006, the arbitration system actually started in, in late 05. But in early 06, they actually not only had arbitrations, they had a reporter. They, in other words, someone was, they, they, they had clerks 
um, volunteer clerks who boiled down the decisions into a reporter, which was then circulated in the community, which made these cases sort of public. And we, we cut off the data set in um, early 07, because when we were doing this work in late 07 and early 08, um, that, that gave us cases that were basically all finished. So we didn't have the problem of, cases, of having to take out a, a lot of cases because they were not concluded. So we did have to wind up, out of the 283 cases, we did drop 16. 11 of them alone were just because the cases were never finally decided due to cited lack of evidence. So we don't have a huge problem, it seems like, with selection bias. But we get, we get 267 cases. I should also mention that any time there's a complaint, almost no cases when, when you have a complaint, you get a decision. We don't have a lot of problem that way. To the extent that there is selection bias in the system, I think our problem would be that people may never bring certain cases. And I think that's, that's one of those problems you deal with. So um, what we